Angela Singley, who has a background in nursing, gave this great comparison to motherhood. There are the floor nurses and then there's the charge nurse who is a nurse by education. Like she, she knows, you know, how to be a nurse, but when she's the charge nurse, she assigns people, patients, she moves patients on and off the floor. She does not have her own patients because how can you manage workers when you're also trying to do the job that the workers are doing? And so that's what I thought of where the only time you're asked to do the work and to manage all the workers is at home. And it's hard. Then she said, yeah, can you imagine like at a restaurant trying to manage everyone, but also serving the food or like also cooking the food? It's just, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's like what you do. You also, you buy the food, (laughs) you cook the food, you serve the food and you clean up the food. Yeah. So I can imagine it pretty well. Yeah. 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 This is the How She Moms podcast with Whitney Archibald. I'm a mother of five on a mission to help moms connect with your kids, manage your homes, and create your own unique version of motherhood. I curate ideas from different moms so you can pick and choose what works for you and your family. It's part two of the How to Share Family Work workshop, and it's time to tell you the story behind the workshop. It all started about 13 years ago when I was pregnant with my third baby. I had a three-year-old and a one-year-old, deep in survival mode. I needed some way to acknowledge the large, Herculean amount of work I was doing each day, and the cleanliness of my house was not the signifier I was looking for. By that measure, I was failing miserably, and yet, I knew I was doing important, exhausting, and very difficult work. It's just that, as we talked about in the last episode, the work I was doing was invisible. What's more, the measure we use in our society to acknowledge and reward hard work, money, did not seem to apply to this, the hardest work I'd ever done, with the longest hours. So one day at nap time, I sat among the toys and Cheerios and opened my computer. I started a new folder called Archibald Inc. Then I created subfolders with all the departments of our little family organization, culinary arts, administrative, education, culture, finance, etc. It was the beginning of my efforts to categorize, define, and create systems for all the work that goes into running a family. I started picking one department a month to work on and created systems one at a time. Ever since then, I've kept the Archibald Inc. file on my computer. I've refined the list of departments, figured out systems for each one, and changed those systems as our family has grown and changed. Through the years, I've periodically made lists of all the work I do, and the work other family members do, to show them exactly what it is I do all day and why I'm so busy, usually followed by a request for them to each pick a few things off my list and add it to theirs. But it wasn't until last year that I realized I needed two comprehensive lists. One that shows the work of caregiving, taking care of the individual people in a family, which is what we talked about in the last episode, and one that shows the work of managing a family organization. Both are family work, and they're very intertwined, but they're different. And so the charts for this workshop were born, and draft after draft, I narrowed down the work of running a family to these two categories, take care of myself and take care of my family. Technically, the take care of myself chart should all fit under its own caregiving category on the take care of my family chart but it's just so big it needed its own separate chart. So in this second half of the workshop about how to share family work, we're going to dive into the work that goes into running a family. We've already talked about what goes into caring for ourselves and the individual people within the family, which constitutes a large part of family work, but there's also the communal responsibilities of feeding a family, taking care of the home itself, and all the things that go into running the organization of a family, including fun things like culture, traditions, recreation, etc. While the discussions in the last episode were more focused on the kids, in this episode, I don't recommend bringing the kids into it until the end. This is a discussion to have with your spouse, partner, or whoever else contributes to taking care of your family. We're going to look at the different types of work, the departments in your family organization, and figure out who's in charge of what, once again designating who are the managers, workers, and helpers in each category. This is not meant to be a guilt trip or a confrontation, although it might bring up some hard topics. It's meant to be a practical discussion about who does what in the family. That said, it's not always an easy conversation. Here's my friend Molly Liggett talking about how it went for her. I wouldn't call it necessarily a peaceful discussion because it did show some areas where one of us was in charge of a lot more, especially that invisible work like buying presents and preparing for holidays. And so it wasn't necessarily a peaceful discussion, but it was a very good discussion. And my husband has been wrapping presents all season with me. (laughs) 
And uh, he's been in charge of buying all the presents for his side of the family. So we've made some definite progress in some areas where we were maybe unequal and it wasn't even visible. We didn't even know that that was such a burden for me. But it was very nice to be able to visually see, here's what I'm in charge of. Here's what you're in charge of. Here's what we're both in charge of. And that was very helpful. There's just so much work that goes into running a family. You could turn it into at least two full-time jobs, but few, if any of us, have the luxury or desire to do that. There's always more that you could do. That's why a big goal of this workshop is prioritizing, figuring out what categories or departments are most important to you at this stage in your life, and which ones can take up less of your time, can be outsourced, or can even be eliminated altogether if they're just not important to you or don't apply. The other goals of this workshop are to make deliberate choices about how you divide labor among family members, to make invisible work visible, to identify areas where you want to improve, and to identify the individual strengths and talents of family members and how to use those to benefit the group. If you have a parenting partner, ideally you'll sit down together with the two charts out in front of you. The first is the Take Care of Myself Family Progress Tracker, hopefully all filled out from going through part one of this course. The second is the Take Care of My Family chart. The goal is to clearly designate who is in charge of what, both with taking care of the kids and taking care of the family. This will look entirely different for each family, depending on employment situations, the strength and talents of each partner, and the many other circumstances that differentiate every family. The goal is to find something that works for you right now, understanding that that will change as time goes by. Some couples will want to nudge the balance to that 50-50 mark, though it's really hard to figure out exactly where that spot might be, since some of the responsibilities are so different. But most couples will look for not necessarily an equal division, but an equitable one. Eve Rodsky made this distinction in her book, Fair Play, adding, What's fair is not always equal, and what is equal is not always fair. I cannot begin to touch the research Eve Rodsky has done into the gendered history of family work, so I highly recommend you read her book, Fair Play, as you go about this process of divvying up your family work. I loved reading it because I realized that we had both basically come up with our own solutions to family work, and of course we came up with different solutions. As you know, if you're a regular listener of the podcast, there's nothing I love more than finding moms who've solved the same problems in different ways. She divides work up a little differently than I do, which is another great perspective. Instead of dividing it into departments, she divided the work into a card game with four suits, home, out, caregiving, and magic, plus wild cards for those life-changing circumstances like moving, new jobs, or new babies that require an extra measure of work. Then she and her husband played the game by dividing those cards between them. Such a great idea. One of the most important concepts in this bo- in her book is the term she coined, the she-fault parent, meaning that especially historically, but still in our culture today, women are often the default parent, taking charge of the majority of the household tasks. That's one of the biggest goals of this discussion, going through each of the categories of family work and deciding who will manage each one so there is no default, no assumptions, no leaving a category blank and just hoping someone will step up. Even if the majority of those tasks still fall on one person's plate, it should be a deliberate choice made by, agreed upon, and acknowledged by the two of you together. Let's start with the Take Care of Myself Family Progress Tracker that you filled out in the first half of this workshop. On this chart, the first column after the categories themselves is a manager column because until your kids are manager of each of these categories themselves, someone has to be in charge. So go through this chart and write the initials of the person who's in charge of each category and or subcategory in the manager column. Who's in charge of baths and brushing teeth? Who puts the kids to bed and helps them wake up in the morning? Who makes sure they eat? Who manages their exercise? Who manages laundry and sorts through their clothes each season? I'm not going to go through every category here because I did so pretty thoroughly in the last episode, but you get the picture. All of these caregiving management and worker roles make up a lot of the invisible work parents do. As you go through them, discuss ways you could each support the other more. Talk about areas the dominant caregiver, if there is one, could use more help. Talk about what you might want to take a more active role in and which categories you'd like to be more of a partnership. Talk about what you like doing the least, and maybe you'll be surprised that your partner doesn't mind it as much. I talked about managers, workers, and helpers in the last episode, but we'll add another category in this one, that of the consultant. I added this category because, especially when David was in medical school and residency, people used to refer to me as a single mom since he was gone so much. His hours have improved a bit since then, but he still works long hours, leaving me to do much of the family management and work. This is something we chose, planned for, and expected. We married so young while we were still in college that we've made all our career decisions together, both of us, with eyes wide open. 
But I always objected to that comparison to single moms because it diminishes the challenge of being an actual single mom, a title for which I have the utmost respect. I also object when people compare us to military families, though there are some similarities. Working long hours is not the same as being deployed and away from your family completely for long stretches and in dangerous places. I have so much gratitude and respect for military families. Part of what makes the role of a single parent so difficult is that even with a good support system, it's hard not to have a partner who you can talk to about the work, about the kids, and make decisions with. I wanted a way to recognize that role of consultant. Even when David isn't taking an active role in one category or another as a manager or a worker, I know at any time I can call on him as an invested consultant. The caregiving roles on this chart will obviously change a lot as your kids grow. Super intense at the beginning with young kids, especially in the categories about basic needs, and then decreasing in some areas as they grow, while ramping up in others, like education, talent development, technology, transportation, scheduling, etc., before settling down again as teenagers become more self-sufficient. It's a wild ride. In our home, I take on most of the caregiving roles as an at-home mom. In families where both parents work and other careers as well, hopefully these are divided more evenly or with some categories outsourced to other caregivers. Now let's dive into the Take Care of My Family chart. I've listed 17 categories, each with subcategories, in the first column. You can type or write the name of each family member, including each parent or caregiver, in the other columns. And on my own chart, I also put the word outsource at the top of the last column so I can indicate which categories we hire out. If other parents also have custody, I recommend putting them on this chart too. Like the Take Care of Myself chart, you first have to designate a color for helpers, workers, and managers, and then put the appropriate dot in each space. I also designated a color for consultant. Unlike that chart, however, there will be a lot of blank spaces where the kids just don't participate. One important thing to remember here is that once you designate a manager, let that person manage. Don't micromanage. Give advice when your partner or child asks, but don't look over his or her shoulder and tell them how you would do it. Unless there's a big problem, let them do it their way, even kids. This can be really hard, but it's also the best way for them to learn. And who knows, their way might be just as good or better. I'll go category by category here. Not all the work that goes into running a family will be shown on this chart, of course. For each department, there's a whole system with lots of logistics and moving parts. I've already released episodes and workshops that go into more detail for many of these categories, so I'll refer to those as I go through in case you want to dive in deeper to any of them. Ultimately, my goal is to write at least one episode for each of these categories to show you several different approaches to managing each department. The very first category in this chart, the executive department, is all about the strategic big picture of your family. If you have a spouse, partner, or co-parent, this is usually a category you'll want to manage together. This is where you'll make the big picture decisions for your family, identify your missions and values, establish your family culture and traditions, make the rules, and hold family meetings. It's possible that I lost you right here. If you're in the thick of raising little kids, the idea of thinking of your family as an organization and running it at a strategic level might seem ridiculous. You're just making it through each day and way to go. That is great for now. This is the stage Angeline Singley and her husband, my brother Brett, are in right now, with seven kids 12 and under, including a new baby. But they actually canceled piano lessons one week so they could make time to hold a family meeting and go through these charts. Even just sitting down and doing things like this with your family, like running it as a, as an organization. Um, so like, that's, I would like to do that, but I don't know that that's our family culture as of yet. We're just like flying by the seats of our pants and just trying to survive. Right. Yeah. And so when you were saying to be more deliberate, I'm finally thinking like, okay, once we don't have a, a baby or a toddler, like you can use your brain and be deliberate for a little, like, I just feel like I've been surviving for 12 years. It's totally normal if you feel the same way, but you might be surprised that a few executive level conversations with your partner once in a while are just the perspective you need to make these survival years a bit more survivable, even if you're just talking about what you hope your culture or values will be like in the future. In our family, both David and I are the managers of this category, basically joint CEOs of the family. But the kids are all workers here too. Each year on Labor Day, we take a family retreat to the mountains and we revisit our list of family values to see if we want to add or revise anything. We vote on a theme for the year. This year's is all in. Last year's was look up. And we set goals for the school year. David usually finds some motivational videos to watch together. I plan team building activities. And then we do lots of outdoor adventures, usually biking, hiking, swimming, etc. 
We go over family rules and revise those too. Then we pull out a calendar and talk about what fun things we want to do together during the year. The last two years, I've made little videos about our retreats. You can find these on the How She Moms YouTube channel and at HowSheMoms.com on the page for this episode. Then throughout the year, usually on Sunday afternoons, we have shorter meetings where we plan our schedule for the week or month, discuss any issues we're having, and usually have a short value lesson where we watch a TED talk, a religious talk, or just have a discussion. We top it off with dessert and a fun activity. The kids are definitely workers here. We plan the meetings and they participate with varying degrees of willingness, especially our teens, and they contribute ideas. I did a whole episode about how other families manage this executive department way back in episode 7, how she strategizes, and then an episode about one family in particular in episode 45, how Liesl Chung strategizes. I'm working on an episode about family meetings too, so let me know if you have any ideas to add. The next category is another big one, income. This will be different for every family, depending on careers and stages of life. Our family has navigated many different ways of doing this. We started off for the first three years of our marriage with a double income, no kids situation. Then I earned the sole while he went to medical school. Once we had kids, he became the sole income provider. Maybe one of these days I'll start making money with this podcast and our situation will change again. Many of you are the sole income source for your families or joint income managers. Whatever your situation, your family needs money from somewhere to be able to function, unless you're one of those amazing off-the-grid self-sufficient families. Finance is a totally different department and could have a totally different manager. David and I are joint managers of this category, though I'm very reluctant about it. This is one of the departments I really don't enjoy managing, and I'm not very good at it. The only C I ever got in school ever was in college in my family money management class. You may notice I don't have an episode about this topic yet because I've been avoiding it, but clearly I need one. So if you have a great system to tell me about, or if you actually like family finance, email me and I'll finally get around to writing this episode. I split this category into investments and budget. I read a great book called The Family CFO about family finances, which suggests that couples each pick one of these categories to be in charge of. That sounds like a great way to divide and conquer. In our family, though, we both kind of manage both with the help of a financial advisor on the investment side. So we also put a manager sticker in the outsource column for this one. Regardless of how you divide it up, if you have a partner, it's good to at least keep each other apprised of what's going on since you're both going to be spending money and planning for your joint future. And you both need to know how to access accounts, etc. in case something happens to one of you. This is one of the categories that appears on both forms. I'm the manager of kids' finances, paying them their allowances and helping them buy stuff. As I'm recording this, I'm realizing that I probably should have made shopping another subcategory, or even its own category. You can always add that category at the end. In fact, I'd really love to know what categories families are adding to that other category so I can continue to revise and improve these charts. I'm sure there are several things I didn't think of. Next up is childcare. Like income, this is another big category that looks deceptively small because it doesn't have subcategories. But that's only because, like I said, you could actually think of the whole take care of myself chart as a subcategories here. In the case of this chart though, I'm talking more about who watches the kids who are young enough that they need round the clock supervision. Babysitting, if you will, though we don't and shouldn't refer to either parent as a babysitter. For this category, I think of when we had a family reunion on a houseboat on Lake Powell. David and I had the only kids on the boat, a baby and a toddler, it was quite frightening to bring a toddler on a houseboat, with drowning potential all around us at all times, and in some ways, having so many adults to outnumber him made it almost more complicated. It would have been easy to assume that someone was watching him. So we came up with a lanyard system, where whoever was in charge of Jonas wore the lanyard around their neck. When they had something else to do, they'd pass Jonas and the lanyard to another adult. That's how childcare is. Someone always has to be in charge. Sure, you can be joint managers of childcare, but there usually is an unspoken default here. In our family, it was always me because I'm home more, but when David was around, I could pass the metaphorical lanyard to him. In other families, it's the opposite. Still others have certain times that one parent is the manager and certain times when it's the other. Now I can pass the lanyard to my older kids. I actually have three babysitters now and only two who need tending, and it's amazing. So my three oldest sons get worker stickers here, and my nine-year-old daughter is a helper here because she often entertains her little brother when I'm at home but busy or helps when the other kids babysit. I'm hoping you also have a go-to person or two or more to outsource childcare to. Before we could rely on our own sons, we had some lovely babysitters so we could get out on dates once in a while. The next category is human resources, HR. 
This may seem funny to have in a family organization, but I needed a name for the jobs of assigning work and overseeing behavior, which, as you know, takes a lot of work, and that's what a corporate HR manager does. As you could guess, since I created these charts, I'm the HR manager over job assignments, and I also oversee the kids' work. Both David and I are behavior managers, making sure the kids mind their P's and Q's and teaching them manners. I do more of the hands-on work of behavior management because I'm around more, but we consult each other frequently and try to be on the same page about consequences, etc. In addition to this episode about assigning work, I also have episodes about teaching kids to clean, episode 11, to be tidy, episode 13, and how to motivate them to work, 15. All of these fit under the HR department, managing your workforce. Of course, they're more than your workforce, but the work still has to get done and the shoe fits. Now we come to the administrative department. I divided this into routines, schedules, and paperwork and mail. I have an entirely separate category for school communication because that's such a big job. Some of my kids are managers of their own routines, which I divide into morning, after school, and bedtime routines. My 11 and 9 year olds are especially into this right now. I help them each come up with a master checklist divided into those three different routines, and they love carrying their clipboards around and checking off what they finish. I barely have to remind them to get their stuff done these days. I periodically do episodes about my own family's routine and all the experimenting I try with my kids. I'm actually due for a new one soon, so I'll work on that. You can find past ones in episode 14, 27, 33, 37, 55, and 67. (laughs) If you're planning on looking into any of the episodes I mention in this episode, don't worry, the full transcript will be up on my website, so you can just link to the episodes I mentioned from this episode. Or you can search through my beautiful new website to find them. I'm pretty excited about it. I'm also the manager of the family schedule, and I run weekly calendar meetings to figure out where everyone needs to be. Those of us with phones share our calendars, just on iCal, so we can see what everyone is up to during the week and coordinate rides, etc. I actually really like managing this for some reason, especially planning for fun adventures, vacations, etc. I've always been like that. I used to adore piecing together my class schedule in college. Paperwork and email is another story. I manage these, but not very well. I always have a billion unread emails, and I hate getting the mail. So if you've emailed me and I haven't responded, uh, I'll just apologize now. I think it's just because it usually means more work to do. But somebody has to do it, and I can usually talk someone else to getting the mail for me, even if I have to sort through it. Food is next. This is a big one. I divided it into three steps, but it could be more. For example, once again, I probably could have made shopping separate from food inventory, but I just kind of put knowing what food you already have and shopping for new food in the same food inventory category. The other two categories are planning the meals and cooking. In our house, I do all three, but of course you could divide this up and have one person plan the meals and shop and another one cook, or any other version of that. This is a great category to involve your kids as either workers or helpers or even managers. One of my son's main chore is to cook dinner for the family once a week. He's the cooking manager for that night. He also plans this weekly meal and adds the ingredients he needs to our online shopping list. I've done a couple episodes about food, how she takes the fight out of food, in episodes 31 and 32, and I have a whole workshop about meal planning. For now, I just put the whole workshop up for free on my website, and you can buy the workbook that goes along with it. Technology is another big one. This is one of the few categories that show up on both charts because each person needs to learn how to manage technology but there are also family level responsibilities. Online safety and managing screen time are on the take care of myself chart because even though it takes a lot of parental management initially, it will eventually be an individual responsibility. I'm the parent assigned to manage these two aspects of tech. We mostly use Circle and the screen time app to manage screen time. I put device management, I put device management and network management under technology on the take care of my family chart, basically to cover the ever evolving and all encompassing world of home IT. From time to time, we have to outsource some of this, mostly when things go wrong. In our family, David cares much more about having the latest devices than I do, so I'm happy to hand over device management to him. He buys any new devices and gets them up and running. We kind of both manage the network, though it skews more to David, trying to get it up and running when it goes down, etc., but we outsource the initial setup of our routers, etc. Since we're talking tech, it's a great time to talk about this episode's sponsor, Better Screen Time. I've already come up with courses to help you create your own laundry system and to create your own meal planning system, and I'm planning to create more workshops. You can find those on my website if you're interested. But one course I'm not planning to create is about how to manage screen time and technology in your home. 
This is because my friend Andrea Davis, who I featured in episode 68, among other episodes, has already created the online course I wish I would have created, Creating a Tech Healthy Family. I became an affiliate for her course because I love it so much, and I wanted to get you a discount, so you could take the course too. My family's actually right in the middle of taking this course, and it's been such a great experience. To give you a little taste of what you'll learn in this course, for the next several episodes, I'm going to share some of the most influential tidbits we've learned. One thing I like about it is that the entire first two modules are first about you as the parent and evaluating your own relationship with tech, and then one about your relationship with your partner in tech, before even getting into the kids or the family as a whole. It sparked a lot of soul-searching and self-evaluation on my part. And my realizations haven't always been flattering. The concept I want to share today is a term that Andrea introduced me to, solitude deprivation, as defined by Cal Newport, a state in which you spend close to zero time alone with your own thoughts and free from input from other minds. Whoa, talk about finding the words I never knew I needed. If there's ever a group that experiences solitude deprivation, it's moms. And yet, when we catch those rare moments to ourselves, we often fill them with scrolling our phones or listening to podcasts, even though I love when you listen to my podcast, instead of in solitude with our own thoughts. Anyway, one of the goals I set for this first section of the Better Screen Time course, Creating a Tech Healthy Family, is to find a bit of time with just my own thoughts each day. If you want to take this course along with my family and I, just go to betterscreentime.com and use the code HOWSHEMOMS at checkout for 20% off. Oh boy, now we've come to the housekeeping category. This is probably the most visible of the invisible work in a family, but it's only visible when it's not done. So unfair. It's also a category that traditionally has been erroneously tethered to motherhood. One of my favorite articles about this is called Housekeeping is Not Motherhood by Rebecca Brown Wright. I'll link it here, or you can Google it. Definitely worth a read. I decided in this housekeeping category to break it down into the common areas of a house. I left plenty of empty spaces so you can add in the specific rooms of your own house. This is how we usually divide cleaning responsibilities. If you don't divide responsibilities by room, you could also use those extra spaces for specific tasks like vacuuming, dusting, clutter pickup, etc. I really could have divided housekeeping into two separate categories, cleaning and organizing, or even three parts if you count tidying and deep cleaning as separate tasks, which I pretty much do, but I didn't want this chart to go on forever. In our family, this is the category in which we assign our kids their main chores. Each one started off being in charge of one common area. This is a system we've used for a while, periodically rotating who was in charge of which room. And then the kitchen we divide into separate jobs, like clearing the table, clearing the counter, emptying the dishwasher, etc. However, as I mentioned earlier, one of my sons asked if he could cook dinner one night a week instead of being in charge of cleaning a room. This was a quick yes from me, so he's exempt from this category, though he still has to clean his own room and bathroom. My daughter liked this idea also, so sometimes we work out a trade where she helps me cook or she cooks something simple by herself for the kids on our date night, and I clean the area she's usually in charge of that week. This is another area we also outsource. So once a week, my friend cleans our main floor while the kids have assignments to clean parts of the basement and the upstairs hallway. As for organizing, I'm really the manager over the whole house, but I often enlist the kids' help for the work, sometimes paying them a bit for helping with big organizing projects, unless it's helping me to organize their own rooms, which they definitely don't get paid for. Next up is facilities, taking care of the home itself. This includes maintenance, improvements, and decor. I usually end up being the maintenance manager, fixing basic plumbing issues, etc., and managing any contractors we need. David and I are joint managers of improvements, making decisions together. And I'd say that he's the decor manager and I'm the worker, though we make a lot of these decisions together too. But he's the one with the vision. He's very artistic and has a great eye, which is very important talent in his field of facial plastic surgery. It's also great for our home. I love his taste. This is a great example of choosing responsibilities based on talents. Education is another of these big categories that appears on both charts. Yes, all the kids will ultimately be in charge of their own learning, but until then, there's a heck of a lot of work for parents. Like the meme that's been circulating about parents having to quit their jobs to read school emails full-time suggests it's a huge job to keep up with school events, school policies, registration, communication with individual teachers, etc. Especially when you start a new school, you have to get to know the systems, communication channels, and even the culture, not to mention volunteering. And that's if you're sending kids to school. If you're homeschooling, that's a whole other ball of wax. 
I did one episode on homeschooling, kind of, in episode 35, How She COVID Schools, but I definitely need to explore that world in more episodes. Another part of managing kids' education these days is figuring out extracurricular camps, lessons, sports teams, etc. One of my friends splits this management responsibility down the middle with her husband. Each one takes half of the kids and signs them up for things and drives them to practice and keeps track of details. David and I definitely decide together about what to sign our kids up for, but I do the driving, communication with teachers and coaches, etc. I talk more about this in episodes 69, 70, and 72 about discovering and developing kids' talents. The other subcategory I included here is basically character education, teaching kids values and spirituality. David and I share this category and trade off teaching when we gather most nights before bed to read scriptures, pray together, and have family discussions. Many families do this less formally, which also works great. Next is transportation. The first two subcategories are about maintaining and purchasing family vehicles. David and I both maintain our own cars, but David is definitely the purchasing manager for both cars and bikes. I'm basically car blind. I'll drive whatever anyone gives me to drive. I don't notice what make or model any car is. I can barely recognize my friend's cars. And I hate the thought of having to go out and test drive different cars and make such a big purchasing decision. Luckily for me, David likes cars and is happy to take over management of this category. I don't consider cleaning the cars as part of this category. I added cars to the housekeeping category on my chart, with me as manager and my kids as workers. David, of course, keeps his own car clean. And it's always clean. Mine, not so much. Then there's chauffeuring, which some weeks feels like just about all I do. With five kids, there's a lot of driving around. I'm about to get a worker in this area since my son will get his license in March, so I'm pretty excited about that. We're new to this, so we're still figuring out if we'll want an extra car for the kids to eventually share. Our plan is to just see how it goes and share until it gets too inconvenient to share. I'm lucky in the health department, too. Although I manage most of the everyday treatments when the kids are sick or injured and I take them to all their appointments, since David's a doctor, I rely on him to make most of the major decisions, although it's usually a team effort still. The exception is a very notable one. I'm usually the one who has to make the call whether to keep kids home sick from school. I hate this one. It's often so hard to tell if they're sick or just extra sleepy or just don't want to go to school. Obviously, these past few years with COVID, I just err on the side of caution, but I've definitely had a few fakers take advantage of that. I didn't add a subcategory for surgeries or procedures, but I'm lucky enough that David is the manager of that too for our family. We were just in his office last weekend to remove my son's mole, and David had stitched up many a laceration in our family, mostly on that same son, actually. For some families, especially those with chronic conditions, mental or physical, that this can be a really big category, which is why I split it into three subcategories. Sometimes appointments alone can be a full-time job. I thought about having separate subcategories for physical and mental health, but the two are so closely intertwined, and the three categories I included really apply to all health. Just know I'm talking about all kinds of health. I added the history department because documenting our lives as a family is both important and a lot of work. David and I divide and conquer in this department too. For a long time, his phone had a better camera, so he became the default photographer. Now that my phone's just as good, he's still the default photographer. (laughs) But as I mentioned earlier, he's much more visually artistic than me, so he takes way better pictures anyway, plus he's had practice. This means we have to make an extra effort to get him in some of the pictures too. We both take charge of sorting through the pictures we take. He's really disciplined about doing this at the end of each day. I've been known to wait a whole year. (laughs) He also posts pictures to our digital frame, one of the best Christmas presents he's ever given me. Keeping it updated as well makes it a gift that keeps on giving. I am the one, however, who puts photo books together and who keeps a written record of our lives, partially through this podcast, actually. Episodes 73, 77, 78, 79, and 80 all talk about recording your family history. The next category, recreation, seems like all fun and games, but I think it's actually one of the most important categories for families. Having fun together is so important to family health and culture. It's part of the glue that holds us together. I divided this into vacation, entertainment, and adventures. David and I are both managers and the main workers in all three categories. And this category definitely requires a lot of work, especially on the planning side. The first subcategory is vacation, pretty self-explanatory. In our family, we have to plan these pretty far in advance because David has to find someone to cover him with his patients and his schedule is booked out pretty far. So we usually discuss the next year's vacation at our family retreats each year. The kids are definitely workers in this planning stage. They are also workers when it comes to packing. 
I print out a custom packing list for each trip and then expect them to pack themselves. Sometimes they end up having to buy underwear on the road, but that's a good learning experience. My sister-in-law, Angeline, liked that this was part of the discussion. When they talked through the list as a family, her oldest daughter, Isla, started making a bucket list of potential family vacations. We, we talk about, you have like six more summers until you go to college. So we should plan out our summers and like, not you know, kind of just th- say, what would you like to do? And then I said, yeah, your last summer, we should go to Hawaii. And her eyes were like, big because it's just like we can barely even get to the grocery store yeah and so she was like really do you think we could do that and I'm like if you planned for it why not yeah and so she was saying so then she started writing down like things she wanted to do and places she wanted to go and Isaiah was helping and it was really fun to hear them dream <laughs> like it was nice the next category is entertainment we're definitely live music enthusiasts so we always plan out a pretty full concert schedule each year We usually give our older kids concert tickets for birthdays and sometimes Christmas, and we go to the symphony as a family several times a year. For your family, maybe this is more about going to the movie theater or sporting events, whatever you enjoy doing together. Then we have adventures. I think more of local adventures here and leave other adventures in the vacation category. For us, this includes local ski trips, rock climbing, hiking, mountain and road biking, etc. This is another category that that changes a lot in different stages of life. Here's what Angeline has to say about adventure with all of her little kids. It's funny because I'm always with a baby. Even like when we go to visit your parents, a lot of times they'll go do something. And I just have a lot of memories just being at that house. And then I think my kids have memories of doing stuff. And I'm like, oh, I wasn't even there. Um, but, but then I did say, if there's ever an adventure that you guys go on, it's because I said, you go on that adventure with your dad. So when they think of event, they don't think of me because yeah. I'm never there, but yeah. I'm like, rest assured, I'm the one that got us to go to Utah in the first place, or I'm the one that sent you to Magic Mountain with your dad, because I don't, I want them to do those things, but it's like, I can't, I can't do them. So with them, I've been so long in the baby stage, like haven't been out of it. So interesting. So we'll see how that goes. But even for Angeline, the time will come when the adventure scale tips from being mostly work to being mostly fun. We eventually got there, even with skiing. Most of the kids can get themselves ready for the slopes, and they can all ski on fun runs now. If you're not there yet, don't worry, it will come. Check out episode 74, How Maria Makes It Fun, and 42, How She Plays With Her Kids and How She Doesn't, for more on this topic. A related category is events. This is split into celebrations like birthdays and holidays and hosting. Obviously, like any of these categories, you could divide these into many different subcategories, like buying gifts, decorating, etc., but you can figure these out within the systems for this department. Or you could make gift giving its own category at the end of the chart, since that one can get pretty big. I'm working on an episode about celebrating birthdays, and episodes 22 and 43 are about celebrating Christmas. The last official category is outreach, with subcategories service and community involvement. This can be individual or as a family. You're probably already doing it within school or church communities. And even if you're not there yet, the time will come when you can talk with your family about who in your community or outside of it you can help with either charitable donations or acts of service. Even just attending neighborhood, school, or community functions counts as community involvement. One of the big ways my family is involved in our community is with music. We have just arranged to sing regularly at a local retirement home, which we started at Christmas time, and every year we put on a neighborhood rock concert. What unique interests or talents can your family contribute to your communities? For ideas, you can check out episodes 21 and 23, How She Serves Family and Friends, and How She Serves Her Community and Beyond. The other category is where you can put categories that are specific to your family or that I may have missed. I'd love to hear what you put here. And that's it. We made it through the whole list. I hope all of these charts help you think more strategically about how you divide the huge amount of work it takes to run a family and take care of your kids. At the least, I hope it makes it more visible. Maybe it will also expose areas where you just need help and inspire you to go out and find someone who can support you in some of these categories. And hopefully, like for my sister-in-law, Kelly Archibald, it can help you just think about all this work a little differently. Like It's kind of like all that mental load, all the mental chaos, I should say, because I feel like that's what it is. In my head, it's just mental chaos. <laughs> like My brain is scrambled, and now this kind of puts it down in a spot where I can see 
logically like where everything goes and and how everything's organized. It organizes the chaos. Thank you so much for listening to the How She Moms podcast and for being part of this community. There are so many other ways for you to connect and hopefully also contribute. I share tips and ideas regularly on Instagram and Facebook at How She Moms. And we also have a Facebook group that you can join, which is the main place for more philosophical discussions about the ideas I'll be discussing on future episodes of the podcast. It's also one of the best ways for you to contribute to future episodes. You can find past episodes and other resources at HowSheMoms.com. I have big plans for revamping my site this fall, so stay tuned for that. And you can always just email me directly at Whitney at HowSheMoms.com. Special thanks to my own wonderful mom, Susan Singley, for recording my theme music. She played this song all the time when I was growing up, and to me, it's the soundtrack of motherhood.